All right, welcome everybody to another Q&A session with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health. Dr. Vanita Dubey, thank you for joining us again today. Hi again. My name is Dilshad Berman. I am a web writer and reporter for City News and 680 News, and I will be moderating this chat today. So we've had questions coming in all week for Dr. Dubey. If you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so while this live broadcast is going on. Just put in a comment and we'll try and get to it as, uh, as soon as we can. We try and squeeze in as much as we can in these half an hour sessions, but usually we have overflow and we try and hold them for the next week. So we'll get them answered, um, maybe just not today. So doctor, are you ready to get started? Yeah, let's go. All right, wonderful. So um, let's get started with a few uh, generic questions regarding just COVID-19 and the nature of COVID-19. Firstly, Matt has a two-part question. He first asks, does blood type play any role in how severe symptoms of the virus are? No, as far as we know, blood type is not related. Uh, there's no indication that uh, if you get infected with the virus, that the type, the type of blood you have makes you more likely to get the infection. Um, it certainly doesn't latch on to particular uh, molecules related to a particular blood type. So there is not an association there as far as we know. Okay, and then part two of his question is, is this a, re a respiratory illness or vascular as it's shown to infect other organs? And what are the implications if it's vascular? So I think it's primarily a respiratory illness. Uh, the way that you actually get infected is mostly through the respiratory system, um, through uh, the nose, the mouth, it gets into the, the lungs uh, classically. That's the classic way it gets infected. What we know though with a lot of respiratory illnesses, including this one, is that um, when you get a severe infection, it can cause a whole body um, response. And that can be a whole body type of inflammatory response. It can affect different organs like the kidneys. Um, and it can also, in this case, affect uh, the vascular system. Um, and that's how um, it impacts the vascular system. It's not necessarily that the bacteria or the virus itself is going into the, into the vascular system and causing um, like the COVID toes that you're talking about talking about uh, or that have been described, it's more likely to be an inflammatory response related to the infection that classically starts from the respiratory system. So I don't know if that was kind of long winded, but whether that made sense. Okay, so basically, it starts in the resp respiratory system, but essentially, the rest of the body um, kind of comes into play because it's also trying to fight the infection. That's a good way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Um, and then let's see, Jeff says, um, can the flu virus cells connect with COVID cells to become a super virus cell? So, I mean, we'll have to wait and see. There's no indication of that. In Australia, um, as you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, they have their flu season before us. Uh, they actually saw that this year their flu season was less severe, uh, probably uh, because there was more, there were more COVID precautions, so that was preventing COVID and also preventing the flu. Um, and there was, as far as I know, no indication that um, getting both viruses at the same time could end up in a super infection, super virus uh, type picture. There's no question though, if you were to be unlucky enough to have two infections at the same time, you could be sicker for sure. Mm -hmm. But whether it's kind of a mutated virus of two viruses together, there's no indication of that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, another, another question related to the flu, Errol asks, um, does the higher dose of the flu vaccine help in any way with COVID-19? Are diabetic seniors better off getting the higher dose? I would say any senior 65 years and older in Ontario should get the high dose vaccine if you can. If it's available, I would definitely recommend that you get that vaccine. If you're a senior and you have a, a medical condition like diabetes, all the more you should get it. That higher dose vaccine will give you better protection against the flu. And by pre preventing the flu, um, you won't be fooled to knowing if that symptom could be COVID or not. Um, and it might then give you some more reserve should you happen to get COVID, um, you know, because it can prevent at least the flu infection. So, so that's why we're recommending it. Um, and I would recommend the high dose vaccine for anyone 65 years and older. Okay. Um, and then and more flu related questions here. Lynn asks, 
Uh, she says, people keep insisting the case numbers are high because the regular flu and a cold will make you test positive for COVID-19. Is this true? No, it's not true. Actually, we know um, from, uh, from doing the tests that actually 95% of people who get tested actually have a negative test. Uh, we know in Toronto, our percent positivity is 4.4%, which means that it's about 4% of people who are tested, of all the people tested, who actually test positive. So, um, and we know that the people who are going for testing, most of them have symptoms or have been in close contact with someone who had COVID. It's not just anyone who can walk in and get tested. Mm -hmm. And so there are plenty of people who have just a cold or other viruses that are being tested negative for COVID. Okay. Perfect. So there's not much overlap in that sense, then there's, there's probably there's no chance that if you have a cold, your COVID test is going to come back positive. If your COVID test comes back positive, it's very likely that you have or had COVID. And that's why it's positive, uh, especially talking about um, our current tests. I mean, there are a lot of new tests that are, that are on the market now. And so some of them have different characteristics. But for the current test at an assessment center that you can get, yes, if it's positive for COVID, it's very, very likely to be COVID. Um, and then we've got some um, questions about daily testing. So Margaret asks, uh, firstly, what number of daily COVID infections need to happen before uh, Toronto or Ontario declares a stage one lockdown? So we're watching this very closely. We certainly do not want to go to the stage of a lockdown. We know that the lockdown in the spring was very difficult for a lot of people, and we're very mindful of that. What we're trying to do coming into this fall, and we've kind of been preparing all summer for, is how can we live with this virus? How can we have, we know that we're going to have a spread of the virus. In fact, throughout the whole summer, we had cases reported every day. We've gone from about 30 cases a day, though, to over 300 cases a day. And that's the part that we need to get control of. But if we can get control of the virus, we don't need a lockdown. And so we can expect to see cases every day. But where they're occurring, how they're spreading, that's what we need to focus on. And that's what we're trying to focus on before considering a, a full-blown lockdown. Okay. Um, and then we have a few more uh, second wave questions. Uh, Mike asks, when can we expect the COVID-19 second wave to peak? So we're certainly on the, on the incline. It's hard to know what it's going to look like. Is it going to be one big peak and then coming down? Sometimes you have a, a peak and then a fall and a peak and a fall. Sometimes you have a slow burn. It's really hard to predict what it's going to look like. I think... Um, we, we started to see that cases were kind of plateauing. Now they're kind of going up a bit. So really, uh, now's the time to keep going with those, those public health measures, to keeping mm -hmm. that physical distance uh, as much as possible, because we have to, we, ha we, we want to see um, that, we've at the, that we're at the peak and we want to see it come down now. Right. Uh, and then I guess we just answered this, a similar question. Um, Shane asks, uh, I'm wondering if you think any parts of Toronto or Durham region will have to roll back to phase one. Are we considering that at all? Uh, right now, uh, we're in a modified stage two and we're trying to see what are the effects of the modified stage two. Um, and uh, so we're keeping close ta tabs on it. I, I would never, nothing is ever impossible with this virus. Right. And so I, I, think, I think definitely if people are thinking, um, okay, well, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I'll keep, you know, going out, visiting friends. It doesn't matter regardless of what the restrictions are. Well, that's, that will end badly. Um, mm -hmm. And we will see more spread in the city. And so I think, I think what I would take away right now is the measures that are in place in the modified stage two are good measures. And if we can all follow those, um, maybe this is as far as, far as, we, as far as we need to go. Okay, okay. Um, and then here we go. Ruben asks, how have mandatory mask policies impacted the second wave? Well, we've, I mean, we've certainly learned a lot, right? We've learned that masks have been helpful. I think the one way that masks have helped us, it says it's allowed it has allowed us to keep workplaces open um, compared to stage one because uh, we know now in a workplace if we have physical distancing if we have masks if we screen people we can prevent the spread of COVID in those places including in schools um, and so I think there's no question that the masks 
have helped to prevent that spread. As you, as you know, my mask protects you, and so it will keep my germs to myself, and, and that will play a role. Um, and so we might be seeing a much larger peak um, if we weren't all uh, focusing on, on the mask usage, for sure. Okay. Uh, and then Freddie has another question here. He would like to know how many mutations of COVID-19 are circulating in Toronto um, and how much do we know about the latest mutation found in Norway? So I can't answer that question. Um, I'm not aware of that. I, I don't work in the lab. Uh, microbiology is not my specialty. Um, I haven't heard of, um, so there's different kinds of mutations, so to speak. I mean, we know that viruses can shift and drift and change. Um, and that's an, actually a normal part of a virus's life cycle. Usually when we talk about um, mutations, we talk about very large changes. Um, in the patterning of the virus. We see this with flu actually, where uh, we have a particular screen, strain and then the virus can actually uh, do an about face. It can actually really change that same strain and then the vaccine may no longer be as effective, for example. I'm not aware of that right now for COVID. Um, I'm sure though that there are people who are, who are watching uh, out for this and um, uh, will certainly be, be watching the literature uh, to see if there's anything to share. What I would say, though, in terms of COVID and any mutations, even if it changes, even if the, the, the structure of it changes so that there is a mutation, there's no evidence right now that um, our public health measures are, need to change because of it. And I think that that's the bottom line here, um, that even if the genome changes, even if there is a mutation, keeping that physical distance, wearing your mask, like all of that stuff is still uh, helpful uh, yeah. uh, regardless. Yeah, right, absolutely. And like you said, when it comes to mutations, then it, it's more of a vaccine issue than it is really a public health measures issue. That's right. A vaccine or sometimes treatments, uh, antibiotics, we've seen that, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then a couple more uh, questions about transmission here. Um, Tina asks, what is the difference between infecting yourself by touching your mouth versus a COVID droplet landing on your salad and then you eat the salad with the droplet on it, how does one infect you but the other doesn't? So we know with respiratory viruses that they often get into our body from our, and we say our nose and our mouth because people may not realize that that's actually part of your respiratory system. When you breathe from your nose, um, when you breathe from your mouth, um, that that's actually every time you take a breath in and out um, that actually goes into your lungs and so so the nose and the mouth are part of the respiratory system and so that's why when you rub uh, even the eyes can uh, it's the mucous membranes can actually then the virus can then infect the mucous membranes they multiply and that's how it gets in, into your system so that's how uh, that's why we say don't touch your face uh, compared to if there's a droplet, say, on a piece of salad and you eat the salad, uh, it's not um, you're swallowing it. You're not breathing in that droplet. So it's not going into your lungs. You're swallowing it. It's going into your stomach and in your stomach, um, it's it's likely to die uh, because of your stomach acids. So so that's the difference there. Even though it goes in your mouth because you're not breathing it in your mouth, just swallowing it, it, it it's different. Yeah, I mean, your digestive system is different from the resp respiratory system and, and those two don't exactly intermingle. Exactly, yeah. Right. Um, okay, and then this is just from Anonymous. Um, our surface is still a hotspot for getting the virus or are droplets the major form of transmission? Or are these we definitely... Yeah, I mean, definitely droplets, a respiratory droplets through that close contact with someone who who may uh, talk to you or spray you within distance. That is the predominant way that we're seeing this virus has spread. But we know with other um, illnesses that are spread through droplets, like the flu, um, that you can touch surfaces and get it. It seems that the surface contamination, fomites, fomites is a way of saying, for example, a toy that's been coughed on, can that toy now infect someone else? that seems to be less less and less of an indication for how COVID is spread. Um, but we can't rule it out. And that's why uh, we still have to pay attention to two surfaces. Okay. Um, a little more about testing here and daily cases. Alan first asks, any possibility of adding rapid antigen tests to the testing strategy? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, so Ontario has received some of these um, new test kits. Uh, you can imagine in a place like Toronto where testing is more available, where uh, labs are available in the city, that, that, that we would rely on what we currently have and which is our better test. But you can imagine in remote areas where they don't have labs in um, where people live, where it may be more difficult to go out and uh, get tested at a lab or at an assessment center, that that might be a good place to start using some of those uh, more mobile testing kits. Um, and so that's uh, what we're seeing right now in Ontario. But um, the future is broad. And so we'll, ha we'll have to wait to see how some of these new test kits uh, may be available for, for all of us, regardless of where we live. Right, right. Um, Catherine asks, how are daily cases reported and counted? Is it when the lab has a positive result from PCR testing? Uh, what portion of the reported cases are part of the likely group that did not have a test? Is the total daily number skewed in any way to account for possible missed cases? So it's a good it's a good question. I mean, in this in the spring, we knew that there were a lot of missed cases because people were not getting tested. So to answer the first question, the case counts are related to most of them are people who are tested and come back positive. When they're positive, it's reported. Um, now there is a group of what we call probable cases. Probable cases are if you had COVID and I was your close contact and now I have symptoms, but I decide not to get tested, well, I will still be counted because I got symptoms within the 14 days from when I was in contact with you. It's very likely that it's COVID, so I will be counted. So they're not 100% lab confirmed, but m many of them are. Now, people who have no close contact with anyone who had COVID, they have symptoms, they never get tested, uh, we'll never know. And so those people are not counted uh, in the ca case counts. And so there, you can imagine that there, there is some role for some, um, some case counts that may be lower as a result. Okay. Um, Ian asks, can you please explain the amplification cycles of PCR tests? What is the CT value range for a positive COVID-19 test result in Toronto? Okay, so that's a very sophisticated question. It's a, uh, so the CT refers to cycle threshold. Uh, and it's, uh, again, I'm not a, a microbiologist or a lab person, but as I understand it, when you're doing the test, uh, it's, it's a way to determine how likely is it that that result that's positive is a true positive, how many replications, so to speak, how many times do you have to um, go through the cycle in order to to get that result. And each lab has their own reporting um, values for the cycle threshold. So I can't say 30, 50, like I can't give you the reference range. It's going to depend upon the lab result uh, in particular. But that's the idea so that you can get a sense of, uh, especially for people who had no symptoms, maybe they're being tested because they have to be tested for for work and they get a positive and you're not sure if it's a false, false positive or, or, or a true positive, that's where that cycle threshold uh, result can be very helpful. Okay, let's take some questions that are coming in live right now. Um, Helen is concerned with hugging her grandkids. She says, I heard that you can hug your grandkids but not face to face. Is that true? And how can we hug our grandkids who are age three to seven? So, you know, we talk about close contact uh, as being, you know, if you were in close contact with someone who had COVID, that's considered a risk and you would have to self-isolate. Close contact, we classically define it as 15 minutes or more within six feet. However, we know, though, that if you have a physical contact, like hugging someone, shaking hands even, if you were coughed on or sneezed on, well, even though that may have lasted seconds, that would be considered a significant exposure. We call it exposure, and you would have to self-isolate. And so that's why something like um, that physical contact is not is not recommended. I think if you um, if you have physical contact with anyone and they go on to develop COVID, you have to recognize that uh, you would first of all have to self isolate for 14 days, and uh, that that's a significant risk that you could uh, perhaps get COVID. Okay. Uh, another one uh, coming in live right now. Rays asks, "Should I shave my beard? Is it necessary when wearing a mask?" So if you're wearing an N95 mask. 
um, where it's fit tested to actually do the fit testing and to make sure that there's no gaps in the mask. Well, then you can't have a beard um, in, in that specific situation. Again, that would be re uh, reserved to very specific healthcare situations. Um, and so that one for sure. Um, in terms of wearing other masks, I mean, the beard may, as long it may cause more, more gaping of your mask, in which case then I would recommend that you shave it. But it's certainly not um, a firm recommendation when you're wearing a cloth mask that you have to be cleanly shaven uh, to wear it. Okay. Uh, one more coming in live right now. Robin asks, we tested 21,000 people a day in June and we had 400 cases a day. Today, the news says that we're testing 44,000 people and seeing 800 daily. Um, so if you're testing two to 2.5 times as many people, statistically, the numbers could be the same as back in June. Is that correct? Well, I guess that that shows um, a, a percent positivity. Um, however, um, our testing strategy has changed. In June, when we were testing people at that time, if you felt like you wanted to get tested, you could get tested. Whereas now, most of the people who are being tested are people who actually need to be tested. So I, I, so I think the rates that we're seeing um, right now are, are showing an evidence for uh, increased transmission. It's not just the number of people who are tested and who test positive. There are a number of other metrics that we look at to see that um, uh, the infection in the community is increasing. Okay. Uh, and then let's go back to the questions that were submitted over the week. Um, Anthony Carlo says, um, some parts of the province have rolled back to modified stage two and other parts have not. How safe are we from the spread of the virus is if people from, say, Toronto go to other parts of the province that have fewer restrictions? And then what can we do to stop this? Because, you know, if I'm not allowed to go indoor dining in Toronto, I might go to a smaller area that's not a COVID hotspot and I'm carrying it with me, if at all, right? Yeah, and so that's why we're actually recommending that if you live in a place that's in a modified stage two, that you you stay within your neighborhood, you stay within your community, you try and avoid non-essential trips. Uh, we've definitely made that recommendation for trick or treating, for example, that um, we're not recommending it uh, in a place like Toronto, York, Peel, and we're asking parents not to take their ch children to other places where it may be going on for exactly that reason. Um, I think what we have to uh, if, if people are going for indoor dining in some of these other places, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but we have to see how can we make indoor dining safer. And I think it's really important to make sure then that that physical distancing is in place, like all of those other measures. But the bottom line is that you should, you should avoid non-essential trips. And that includes outside of your community because we're trying to prevent the spread of this virus. Right, absolutely. Uh, Sista has an interesting question here. How can I support a family or friend uh, who is positive, positive for COVID-19? What can I do to help? Really good question. The first thing is to avoid stigmatizing them, um, laying blame on them, making them uh, feel like somehow they brought this upon themselves. COVID is, that does, is not helpful. So I think supporting them uh, by providing meals for them, providing them emotional support virtually. Um, they can't do their groceries. They can't leave the house uh, if there's things that they need by helping them that way. And then we know that um, there's a huge mental health component of getting COVID um, and being able to help uh, with that uh, is actually, I think, a really valuable way to help support someone who, who's had COVID. Absolutely. Uh, we have more questions coming in live right now. Let's quickly get to those. Um, Judy asks, if the virus is spreading through people who are not social distancing and not wearing masks, then how come we have outbreaks in nursing homes and hospitals because aren't they wearing their masks and PPE and aren't they taking all of those protocols so shouldn't hospitals and those kind of places be the cleanest, most germ-free environments possible? How are we still having outbreaks? Yeah, so I think we have to uh, understand how are we getting outbreaks in those situations. And actually, that's the role of public health. And so if there's a case that's in a nursing home, um, we try and figure out, well, who is it that got COVID there? And what can we do to prevent it? You can see that some of the visitor policies... Um, are in place, they become more restrictive uh, when there are cases because that has shown to be a role where visitors can come and uh, unknowingly um, bring COVID with them, for example. And so, so I think that um, it's not just about the healthcare workers who work in these settings. Um, 
it's also about some of the interactions uh, that people have with with the public as well. Right. And I, I believe last week as well, when we spoke about it, why are there outbreaks in hospitals? You mentioned that, you know, ultimately hospitals are sta staffed by human beings and people and human error is a thing and those things can happen. So, you know, despite yeah. The, yeah. Exactly. And even in a workplace, like a hospital as a workplace, sometimes it's the healthcare workers who do everything right when they're with the patients. And then we find the staff room. I mean, the staff room is a big risk, no matter what kind of work you're doing, where you take your mask off, you take your PP off, you're eating your lunch. And next thing you know, you're eating lunch closer to someone um, than you thought. And that's how it spreads. We've seen that in schools. We've seen that in workplaces. We've seen that in hospitals. So um, that that's another way that the virus is spreading. Okay. Uh, and one more question coming in live. Um, Lori asks, can a chest x-ray detect COVID? No, it cannot definitively say, okay, that's COVID. Now, a chest x-ray can tell you findings that, okay, it looks like this is COVID. Um, and you certainly don't always rely on the 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 test to say this is COVID or not. So uh, so your chest x-ray can be abnormal, but a chest x-ray, you can't say, okay, I had a chest x-ray. It was clear. That means I don't have COVID. You cannot do that. Right. Okay. Because it can show, it can be any other virus. It could be any other thing. It could be pneumonia, but it doesn't necessarily say it's COVID. Or it could be clear. Your chest x-ray could be clear and yeah. still you have COVID. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, all right. That's, that's important to know because one would assume that the congestion or something would show up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, let's go back to the questions submitted. Um, JP says, my son is having his confirmation next week. And I was wondering why it's okay for a church to have 10 students from a grade eight classroom, plus 12 additional family members per student as guests. With the numbers going up daily, it's very disconcerting. Um, there have been weddings that have been super spreaders. And so yet you can still go to church and have a confirmation ceremony. So the guidelines for um, uh, ceremonies, rites, um, um, are that uh, you can have 30% of the room's capacity with public health measures. So it means um, physical distance at all times, cleaning, screening, um, no singing, uh, uh, all, all kinds of measures where we have recommendations not to share um, materials uh, related to it. Uh, and so they are allowed to proceed with, with precautions and that's based on um, the provincial regulations. Okay, and another interesting one actually coming in live right now, Muhammad asks, is going to the emergency room right now safe? Yes, yes, it, it is safe. And the reason why I tell you that is because if you need emergency care, go. We will make sure that it will be safe for you. What's more unsafe is if you need emergency care and you decide to stay at home. That's going to be more unsafe for you. And um, again, I can say from my own experience working in an emergency room, we have a lot of precautions in place. You will wear a mask. I will wear a mask, I will wear a visor, we will be doing our cleaning and sanitizing, but if you need care, go. It is, it, that is a safe thing to do. Okay. Um, dad and son asks, uh, I live in a house and the house is divided into four apartments. Can my apartment on the second floor be affected by germs throughout the other apartments because of the venting system? Uh, the short answer is no, uh, very unlikely. Um, now, I don't know exactly what kind of venting system you have. And, you know, if there's a direct hole from one to another, um, and, and I don't mean a vent, like I mean a hole or something, right? Or do you share the same door to come in? Could it be a surface contamination? But we know um, what I would say is for the house, you would figure out what is your a heating or ventilation system in the house. Uh, if you are able to control air exchanges with the furnace, for example, I would do that. Change the HEPA filter, I would do that as well. Um, but if the ventilation is, um, it, it's just air that's circulated uh, in and out, then the risk, there should not be a risk. Now, that being said, you can also open your windows to help increase the air exchanges uh, as well. Okay. Um... We have two minutes, so I'll try and get in a few more questions. Um, Jason asks, in addition to daily infection numbers and deaths, why are hospital capacity numbers like total beds and ICU beds not reported? 
Uh, so actually, if you go on Toronto Public Health's website, we have a monitoring dashboard. It's called the monitoring dashboard under under our statistics page. And you can see there that there is a whole section there for healthcare system capacity. So you can get a sense for, um, and again, that's green, yellow, and red for uh, how much capacity we have in our healthcare system. So you can look that up for sure. Okay, perfect. That's available then. Um, and then Anita asks, uh, we didn't wear masks during SARS or H1N1. Why are we wearing it during COVID-19? Yeah, we didn't wear SARS. We didn't wear masks during SARS, and yet in other parts of the the world they did actually, um, and uh, that's how they were uh, more prepared to start wearing masks because of COVID nineteen. Uh, actually, that's been well documented that uh, some of the East Asian countries were wearing masks during SARS, and so they started wearing masks sooner for uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, so I think that we're we're learning as we go. With SARS, we found that the virus was different. While it's the same family, it was different. And it was being spread more in a healthcare setting. It wasn't being spread as easily in a community setting. And so that's probably why we didn't see widespread use of masks um, then. That was also almost 20 years ago. And so I think um, our research and our understanding of the use of masks um, it, it is evolving. It's, we're still learning a lot about it, though. Right, absolutely. Uh, and then a couple more mask questions here. Um, Linda says, my husband works in the lab and I have asthma. He wears a mask around me and others, but says that he cannot breathe if he covers his nose. Is there any other kind of mask that he can wear or any other protection he can take because, you know, just covering your mouth is not enough with a mask? I would say try other masks. I think you have to find one, uh, sometimes the one with the wires, even if it's a cloth mask with a wire over the nose so that you can have more space in between the mask and your nose is actually quite helpful. It takes practice. And I think there's no question that uh, it's not one size fits all. Um, but I am confident that most people can find a mask that fits them. And if they practice, you really have to practice how to talk with the mask on, um, maybe don't talk with your mask on, that may help him as well. Um, to figure out how, how to wear it. It does take a lot of practice. Okay, uh, and with that, actually we are at 101, so we're a minute over, but thank you for staying with us, doctor. And uh, we will get to all of the other questions that we couldn't get to this week, next week. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay, bye-bye. Right, thank you everybody for joining us.